welcome to module 10 of a course called Coding for Crosswords. In the previous module, we developed the concept of a hash table, and we started by looking at how you find words in a library. In this module, what we're going to do is see how we use the standard C++ STL hash table. So let's start by looking at what hash table is. A nice description is in Wikipedia, actually. It's a very central topic in computer science. And we can see here a um, nice picture of what it's doing. The main idea of a hash table is it's taking keys and it maps them to values. So it's a key value map. That's why it's also called a dictionary. And if you look at this picture here, it's the same mechanism we developed last time where we use a hash function to compute a bucket number for each key and then we store that value in that bucket. This allows very fast retrieval of that information. The C++ STL library used to call this a hash map object. Now they call it an unordered map. And that's an interesting name because it means that when you hash these values into these buckets, you lose the original order. You might hash them in the order John, Lisa, Sandra, but you can see the way they're stored. They're gonna come out. If you read these buckets in order, you would get Lisa, John, Sandra. So that's why they emphasize this with the name unordered map. There's also a C++ map, which is ordered, which uses a tree internally, which stores the order uh, of the elements. Um, um, but in the regular hash table, um, also called a hash map in common usage, um, it's unordered. So let's go look at what that really is. So we have to go to C++ unordered map, and it pops up here pretty fast. It's a very common class. Let's go look at that and see what it says. Now, we're used to these C STL containers like vector, which takes one type. You know, you have a vector of ints or you have a vector of strings. In an unordered map case, the hash table case, you have two parameters. You have the key, which in our case is a string, and then you have the value, which is in our case, the word object. So let's look at how we do this. We're gonna say unordered map when we define this type and we're gonna use a string here and we're gonna put a word in here, right? And let's read a little bit about what it says. It's an associative container. Associative means it maps one thing to another that stores elements formed by the combination of a key value and a mapped value. And as we saw last time in module nine, allows for fast retrieval of individual elements based on their keys. The key value is used to identify the element while the mapped value is essentially any object you want. It's not used in any way by the hash table other than just that that's the thing that you retrieve when you do a query. They're not sorted in any order. Um, they're fast. Um, and then you can use the actual direct access operator, which makes it look a little bit like a vector. Instead of giving it an index like 0, 1, 2, 3 and getting right to that element, you use the square brackets to give it the key, the string, and it gives you back the answer, but also very fast. So being armed with that, let's, and there's quite a lot of, of, of detail here, which we'll, which we'll get into. Being armed with that, let's go back to look at our source file and let's change our implementation of the hash function to replace what we have with our manual buckets and, and that shelf business. We're gonna remove that and replace it with the unordered map. Um, there are first two housekeeping things that I want to do, and they're gonna be quick, but I just wanna get them done because um, it'll clean the code up. The first is in this struct word, uh, in constructor style, I wrote it this way just to be more explanatory, but really there are two ways to initialize things in a, in a struct or a class that are, that are better than, than this. And the part that I'm talking about being bad is this. Um, this is not a very standard way to do a constructor. 
The best way is to put the constructor initializer in here. So you, you could initialize everything to dog if you wanted to. That's not a very realistic initializer, but that would work. Um, but in our case, we want to give the string when we initialize the word. So we put it this way. This is the syntax. You put a colon and then word gets s. And you don't even have these lines. Okay, so that's the more standard way to do the initializer. And all the constructors from now on, I'll use that standard technique. The other thing I want to change, which is minor, is in the library class here. If we go to the bottom of it, you'll see these private fields. Now, I've gotten used to the Google coding style, which is similar to other types of coding styles like this, where the private data gets its own uh, little syntax. And the syntax that I like is this trailing underscore. So these three fields get a trailing underscore. So why? Well, you don't need it, but it's a nice designator that those are private data. Um, when you write, a, like suppose you had a name, if you had a name like this, a common thing might be to do is to have an accessor like const string, well, you can do it like this, name const return name. Um, so having the underscore here sets you up to provide an accessor function, which is read only. It's not going to modify the object that will return the underlying thing. So this is a convention that works. It's consistent. Um, and that's what I'll be adopting for the rest of this course. Um, so let's get rid of this name for now. So we need to adjust these three. So just as a housekeeping, let's go back and look for all the times when I use words. And we will change it to words underscore. Okay, we'll do that there and there and there and there. And then we'll do the same thing with shells. Actually, shells we're going to get rid of, so I'll just leave that for now. And the same thing with counts. So let's replace this with counts, 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 and counts. Okay. Um, actually, I can. Yeah, why don't we just go ahead and change shell just so I can recompile it. Um, Okay, we did those. So let's just go ahead and check that I didn't uh, mess any of that up. So that's the standard command in our environment. It's G++ minus OA and then A dot C. And so that still works and that runs and we're still printing. If you look at what we're doing, we're printing the debug buckets. We can take that out. We can um, look at what we're doing. We're checking to see if these six words are in the library. Let's check that again and see what it gives us. And it's saying, right, it's saying that Dog is a word. This this crazy string is not a word. And these are all words again. One, 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 one. Why don't we make one of those? Let's put in some garbage text in here. And then let's make one of them miss just so that we can have another example of a miss. So there we see that this one now misses. Okay, so let's do the hard work of this module. And this module won't be as bad as the previous one. That was a lot of work, so congrats for making it through that. Um, that was a lot of typing of code. This won't be so much typing of code. It's going to be more just using and understanding the hash table interface. So let's start by looking at where shelves is used because shelves is going to be going away. This, this thing here, we're going to remove it. Uh, in its place, we're going to put in a map. And... To do that, I'm going to use another type dev. Let's go back up to where the word is defined. Um, here's the struct of words, and I've defined a vector of word to be words. So that's a group of words. I'm going to define an unordered map of word, but it's not just word now. It has to be a string mapping to a word. It's a pair. It's a key and a value. So an unordered map, which is a hash table, mapping from string to word, and I'm going to call that a word map, okay? And there's one more detail we have to add. Back up at the top of the file, we have to add this unordered map as an include. Let's put it up by the vector. Just like uh, we had to put vector in here and we had to put string in here, we have to also put that in there. Otherwise, I won't know what an unordered map is. Okay, so let's... Now we have this thing called a word map. Let's go back to the bottom of the library class and we will change what we had here. It's, a it's no longer a vector of words. It's going to be a word map, right? 
and we're going to call it word map. I think is a good name for it. Okay, so that's our starting point. We've gotten rid of those custom shelves that we built to demonstrate the concept. And now we're just going to have one master list of words, which is this thing here. And then we're going to have one hash table of words, which is this. Now it's, it's um, not always done, but it's sometimes done like this where you keep a separate list of the same things you're putting in the hash table, just because this is ordered. You know, this is a vector of the words in the original order. So if you want to find word number 100, you can find it easily. This, as we've talked about, is unordered, but it's very fast to retrieve. So sometimes we'll, we'll keep these both right now. We don't have to, but if we keep them both, uh, it gives us a chance to offer both those queries um, very fast at the expense of a little bit of memory and a little bit of extra bookkeeping. So let's look at where the shelf appeared. And we're going to have to replace those with our new word map. And in general, the code's going to get smaller. We did a lot of stuff manually in module nine. Um, now we're going to replace that with these calls to the built-in hash table. So first is the initialization. Well, we had to resize those buckets to 26, right? Well, guess what? The built-in hash map does all that for you. So this just totally goes away. We don't need to have any initializer. It will automatically resize itself. As you add things to it, it will add more buckets to itself. And we're going to talk about that. That's a very key behavior of the built-in hash map or the unordered map. Um, so that one goes away. The next one is this is word. Well, we don't have a bucket number anymore. In fact, this whole bucket thing totally goes away. Let's get rid of this bucket. We no longer have to write our own hash function. So I'm going to remove all of this. So everything to do with a bucket is gone. Number of buckets is gone. All that stuff we did manually um, is now going to be done. Now the is word is the lookup. And we know it's going to be of this form, word map. And then we know it's going to have something here and we're going to return. We're not going to have to iterate ourselves over these buckets. So let's just get rid of this stuff. Okay. And if you go look at the interface, there are at least two ways to do this. The way we're going to use first, because it's easy, is we're going to use this routine called count. This counts the number of elements, the number of values that you've put into the hash table that have a specific key. So the string is our key, right? So we're going to go back here and we're going to say word map. We're going to say count. Count what? We're going to count the string. All we're going to, It's going to give us back, and since we only ever, in our case, insert one word for every key, this routine is only going to return zero or one. But well, we're going to want to return for this greater than zero, like this. So it's going to be a word if the count of elements in our hash table is greater than zero for that key string. And that's it. That's, that's all there is to doing a lookup. So let's keep looking for other things we have to change. Here is part of the read from file, right? So here we're reading the original file. We're, we're getting every word out of the file. So this loop here is being executed uh, 12,000 times, um, actually 12,001, and then this stuff in here gets executed 12,000 times. And here's where we're putting the word on the master list of words, and then this is the line we want to change because we no longer have shelves. So, so that line's going to go away. Um, we're going to delete it in a second. So with this line, we want to add something to the word map. We know it's going to be a key value pair with line and with this word line, right? Um, the way I want to show you first, there's a few ways to do this, but this operator is a reasonable way to do it. Um, and let's read about what it does. You can use this operator on either the left side or the right side of an equal sign of an assignment. If K does not match the, the key of any element already in the container, the function inserts a new element with that key and returns a reference to it. So what that means is that over here in our code, what we want, the key we want is line, right? Line is the name of the word. Line is the string that it identifies the word. So we, it's the key to the hash table. So we do line and then we're going to assign to it what? We're going to make a new word and then the word also happens to use line as an argument to it. It wouldn't in general need to be this way, but the thing that we're using to index the word happens to also be the main argument to the constructor of the word. 
So once we have that, we can get rid of this. Now, there's this will work except for one thing. And um, let's just go through and hit the other uses of the shelves. And then I will, we'll talk about that one thing. So here's another use of the shelves. We had a debug buckets. There's another way to do this. We're gonna just defer this. Let's comment this out for now. We're gonna put this back later using routines from the actual STL hash map. For now, we're gonna just um, duck that work. And we're going to look for shelves. I think we've got all of it done now. Yeah, just these two that are commented out. So we're gonna compile this, but it's gonna fail. It should fail. And it should fail spectacularly because these uh, template errors are really bad. <laughs> yeah, so here we go. So it fails with this really horrible error. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of spectacular. The thing you want to look at is right here. Error, no matching call for call to Word. And what is that? That's the constructor for Word. It's missing a constructor for Word. If we comment this line out and recompile, you'll see it should compile okay. Yeah. So it is definitely this line that's triggering that. And, and why? Let me just explain that. When you use this operator on a hash map and it does not have that line yet, what it does first is it makes one of the entries in your hash table that tries to call the constructor, the empty or the default constructor, and then it takes the thing over here and it assigns it to it. And it's failing on that step. It doesn't see, because if you go look at the struct for word, in the word class, we do not have a default constructor. We have only this one constructor that takes a string. The default constructor is, is something that takes no arguments. And what we need to do is just add that. Now what that's gonna do, it's gonna create a word with an empty, uh, you know, it creates a capital W word class with an empty string word in it. And that's fine. Because what happens when we look at the read from file, where we're calling this here in this line, which is the cause of our trouble, um, it first makes an empty word and then it assigns this word to it. So it's okay that the default constructor just makes an empty, an empty string here because it's, a, it's about to be overwritten by, by this one. So that's the fix that we need, which is not obvious from this error code. Um, and that's why using these hash maps, once you start to use them and you get a template in your mind, you'll, you'll kind of stick with the templates and that should be good enough. Now let's compile this and it works and let's see if it gives the right answer. So this is the same as before. So yes, we have the dog. No, we have the other words and then we have no for that final word um, that we checked for. That's, 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 that's this new one, this AAJF we put in, which is not a word. So that's it. We've already done it. We've used the standard C++ STL library hash table, which is called unordered map. And our code works and it's very fast. Now, let's just spend the rest of the module investigating more about what that object does. What does that hash table really do? And how does it relate to how we did things? You know, does it use buckets? How many buckets? Um, so there's a few things to explore there. The first thing, let's go back and look at the way we're using the count query. Now, this is one way to look at what's in the hash table. We really should look, so let's just hold this and let's try to do another way. And, and there's a more general way to try to find what's in a hash table and that's with the operator called find. And so let's, let's understand that one because you're going to need to use that one when you want to find elements in the hash table. So it's here back in the, this is the main page for the unordered map. So we're looking at this standard unordered map page. And if you go down all the way to where find is, that's the primary interface, element lookup. We used count already, but now we're gonna go look at find. And here we are. And all you do is you give find the key, which in our case is the string. So let's go back over here. Um, and we're going to write word map dot find. This is a little mini challenge. What do you put in there? Well, it's just like the count, it's just the key. So that's it. The tricky part about using the find operator on a hash table is not passing the argument to it. That's just the key. The tricky part is the return value. It returns this thing here, over here you can see called an iterator. Now that's a little bit of a complicated beast uh, and we're gonna investigate it. Um, 
the first thing is to actually define what that thing is. The, the, the type of it is really horrible. If you go to their example here, um, this is how you would actually define it. So you'd actually have to have this, everything I have highlighted here, standard, we don't need that because we have the namespace, unordered map, string to double. So in this example that they've given on this page, it's a map from string to floating point numbers. Now we've done string to word, and then you'd say const iterator. There's both an iterator and a const iterator. That's a lot of stuff to type. So there's this great keyword that we're gonna introduce now called auto. And auto just looks like this. And auto says we're gonna have an iterator, and people use IT a lot for the iterators. We're gonna define an iterator, and it's gonna be whatever word map find returns. And that IT is going to be just of whatever type it needs to be. So it's kind of funny. It's like C++, which is a heavily typed language. In this case, kind of looks uh, uh, like an untyped language. This is the kind of thing you would see in Python, where you would just assign something to a variable and you would just let the interpreter figure out the right uh, type for it. That's kind of what we're doing here, although it is determined at compile time. But the auto IT will, will, will catch the return value of this find. And then what do we do with it? What does that iterator mean? Well, the iterator is defined back up here. Let's look back in the main page for iterator. Um, and it's described here. They point to the elements of the map uh, with both the key and the value. So what you get back from an iterator is actually this thing called a pair, which is another STL container. And it has something called the first and something called the second. And the first will be the key and the second will be the value. If we go back to the find page, we'll see that when the iterator does not find that key in the hash table, it returns something called end, map.end. So let's just code this and I'll show you what that looks like. So if iterator equals word map dot end, it's like this special magic value that is for that word map that says uh, nothing. I didn't find anything. That's what that value means. If that's true, then what do we do? We return false. Otherwise, we return true. Um, you can also tighten this up to just a single line if you want, um, these five lines here. Um, let's just check if that works um, and will give us the same answers as before. So let's jump down here to the compile window and run it, and we do get the same answers. Now we'd like to explore the behavior of the hash table. How is it really working? There's a set of functions down here called buckets that gives us some insight into how the hash table is functioning. And let's take the very most basic one called bucket count, return the number of buckets. Remember last time how we had 1,001 buckets and that did a pretty good job of distributing the 12,000 words into each bucket. And it was maybe there'd be five words in one bucket and 15 in the next, but in general, there were about 10 words per bucket. Let's investigate what type of buckets this hash table is using. And we can do it by printing out the bucket count as we're adding words to the hash table. So let's do that. That's back in the code called read from file, remember? So we're reading from the file. We're getting one word per line. When the line's not empty, we convert it to uppercase. We handle this line feed problem with the DOS files. And then we push the word back into the master list. And then we're going to add that word to the hash table. Right after we do that, let's just for debug purposes say debug new bucket count equals, and then we're gonna put in word map bucket count, right? Okay, so this is a challenge for you. Code that just like I've done and run that and see if you can understand what it's doing and try to imagine what it's doing behind the scenes to give you the output that you see. Okay, welcome back. Let's see how that worked. First we compile it, and then we run it, and this is gonna produce a lot of output, right? 12,000 lines of output, so look at that. Let's do a thing on, on Linux, I can do this. I can redirect it to a file, and then I can look at that file. And here's what it says. It says new bucket count is 13. 
Huh. So it's 13 for the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, all the way up to 13 things that we add, the bucket count is 13. Then suddenly, the bucket count, when we add the 14th thing, the bucket count goes to 29. So what just happened there? That is called a rehash operation, and that's fundamental to the whole notion of hash tables. You don't want to take a hash table and allocate a billion buckets to it right away because you might not use them. You may only have 100 things for that table. So the hash table will resize itself when it reaches certain thresholds. And in fact, there's another function here, which is an interesting metric of a hash table called the load factor. That is how full on average would each bucket be? So our load factor for the hash table we did in module nine was about 10 because we're about 12 because we had 12,000 words and we had a thousand buckets. It turns out that the STL hash table manages that load factor very carefully so that when it reaches a certain threshold, it will resize the hash table, rehash everything. So all those things have to be moved and rehashed into a different spot with a different hash function, but the hash table is much bigger and now it can absorb much more. And if you look at this file, you'll see it keeps rehashing. Look at that. Every time you keep adding more things to it, it keeps going up. Now it's 257. We're, we're, we're at line 250. 278. Let's see when it grows again. I'm scrolling down. It grows again here. It grows to 1109. Those are nice prime numbers again. It's picking prime number for the sizes. That is um, at line 542. So as soon as it got bigger than the 541 buckets that it had. So it's, it looks like what it's doing is whenever it exceeds a load factor of one, it's doubling, roughly doubling the size. So let's check that. Let's add to this statement here. Let's add the load factor equals, and let's put in the load factor, word map load factor. Okay, so that's a second challenge. Um, run that and see what you get. And let's see what that does. And we get, let's again, let's put that into a file and then look at the file. So here we go. The load factor goes from very low all the way up to one. And then as soon as we exceed one, it doesn't go above one. It just rehashes everything onto a bigger hash table. So it keeps doing that. And we'll see in the next lecture, that is really important because what it means is the hash table is copying your data. So where you think your data lives in memory in the first hash table, if you insert something in the hash table, it's not always going to be there. If the hash table rehash, because you add more things to the hash table, it can move everything. So we do need to start grappling with the notion of what memory is and where are objects in memory and when do they move on you. And that is the subject for the, the, the next lecture. But there's a few more things to do here on the, uh, on the hash table. Um, one more thing we can do is to debug the distribution of buckets. Remember how we dumped all the buckets out? There's a way to do that with this hash table too. And it's back here on the buckets debug thing. There's a thing called bucket size. You can get the bucket count. And then for each of those buckets, you can query the bucket size. Um, and then you can print that out just like we did before. So we had called that thing debug bucket. And remember I had commented this out at the start of this module. Let's put that back in again. This time there's no more shells, but there is what? I'm gonna leave this as an exercise for a challenge. You're gonna iterate over something. So something goes in here, and then you're going to call something, and then you're gonna print out something. Okay, so I'm kind of giving you a template. See if it's a challenge, you can, you can figure that out, and I'll give you a hint in a second. Okay, the hint is the thing that goes in here is going to be the bucket count of the hash table. The thing that goes in here that you're calling every time is going to be the actual bucket size of that bucket, and then you're gonna print that out. Okay, so give that a try, if that helps. And welcome back, let's do that together. So this is going to be word map, and then what? It's going to be bucket count. All right, so this is gonna be a loop. We're using I, it goes from zero up to almost the bucket count, one less than the bucket count. 
And then for every one of those buckets, what we're going to do is print out, we can print out I, and then we, just like we did last time, and we can print out word map bucket size I, okay? And then let's make sure we call that debug buckets. We had commented it out, so I'll put that back in again. And let's go back to the read from file, and let's take out this. So you see this these two lines here we were just doing just a minute ago to debug how the hash table grows. Let's take those out just to avoid too much stuff printing to be a little less confusing. Okay, let's compile that. And we compile okay and we run and it's printing out all the bucket sizes. Let's look at those. Now look how many buckets there are, 20,000. That's because we put in 12,000 things. So it must've been around 10,000 when we added one too many and it said, you got too many, we're gonna double it again. So the next thing it doubled to was 20,000. So look, we have, we actually have more buckets than we have items, and that's the way the hash table will always work so that it's very fast. So look, everything pretty much has one or zero and sometimes two buckets. If we run that and put it into a file again and look at that, we can search for when there might be five things. A couple of times there's five things in a bucket. Is are there any times when there's six things in a bucket? There's one, two times there's six things in a bucket, and then seven, there's never any bucket with seven. So you get the occasional bucket that has three or four or even five things in it or six, but you never get anything with seven in it. So that's in general very fast. And so by scaling the bucket count constantly as you add things to the to the hash table, what you do is preserve the order one. Remember the order, the big old complexity we talked about in the last module. If you keep scaling the number of buckets in your hash table along with your N, you guarantee that the performance of your hash table will stay order one. And that means that your hash table will be extremely fast. But you do burn memory for that. You have those uh, buckets all across your memory. So that's the last topic for this module. I hope this module was a little easier than the previous one and that you're ready for the next module, which is going to be a little bit harder again. We're going to talk about memory and the way that memory is allocated and some of the kind of nitty gritty issues. And that's going to prepare ourselves for then finishing up the dog cat crossword puzzle where we'll be able to really fill in the crossword puzzle with all the missing words and um, you know print out the final puzzle and that'll be the goal. So we're kind of over the hump I think. We're on to the final home stretch once we get through the memory and we'll start to get to some fun results in just a few modules. So hang in there and we'll see you in the next module.